you're going to get lots of comments on what you just shared. And the comments are going to be like, wow, Justin, I like you even more now because you're willing to share that. You're willing to share that you're human. What's up, guys? Uh, it's Justin Kahn, and you're listening to The Quest. And today, I'm so excited. I have my very special guest, Matt Mochari, who is uh, previously my CEO coach at Atrium. But he's, been a, he's an amazing human being, one of the most open and authentic people that I've ever met. Um, Matt was a serial entrepreneur and uh, later found purpose going through kind of a conscious leadership program group program uh, to become an amazing coach and coaches, you know, kind of incredible companies that I'll let you talk about if you, uh, if you're open to it, Matt, how are you? Thanks for, um, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Great to see you, Justin. It's been too long. Right I on. know it has been a long time. When was the last time that we actually talked? Probably like a year ago. Well, more importantly, saw each other at least a year, a year ago. And that's the yes. thing. I, what I miss is giving you a big hug. So I look forward to doing that soon. <laughs> well, let's, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about our history and how we know each other and how yeah. you got into the point where you, you've had like multiple lives, like kind of like three, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm probably like undercounting them, but at least three phases of life that I can count, you know, like being an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and this dur- during the first dot-com boom. And then it, you had like a long period of time where you had made money and had a lot of fun and then kind of coming back as, uh, you know, the coach to this huge generation of, of, of kind of big internet companies like, you know, Reddit, Coinbase, uh, uh, Flexports and all sorts of amazing companies. So tell me like, how did you, let's start at the beginning. How did you start? What, what made you become an entrepreneur? So I started off, um, after business school, I joined a, a private equity firm called Spectrum Equity. And this was right when internet 1.0 was sort of getting started. And after just two years there, I realized, oh my gosh, you know, these, everyone's getting super wealthy and, and, uh, uh, and they're, you know, it's kind of like the people who are unemployed were the people who <laughs> went and founded companies. And then they're the ones making hundreds of millions of dollars. I thought this is crazy. And so I wanted to go jump on that train. Um, and I, I sort of foolishly thought that if I could, uh, go start a company, I could then come back to being a, a private equity investor if I wanted to, which of course was ridiculous, but I did start a company, um, called totality ended up doing well, got bought by Verizon. So that was a good financial event. And then I just decided to take off and have fun. And so I surfed for two years and it was amazing. And I could have kept doing that for the rest of my life. Um, but after about two years, my friends stopped taking my calls cause they just didn't want to hear about the great wave, the last great wave that I'd been on. So then I realized, uh Oh, I, I can either keep surfing or keep my friends. I decided I wanted to keep my friends. They were doing things that were challenging. So I figured I needed to go back and do something that was challenging, but I didn't want to start another company cause that would just create more money. And it turns out I hadn't spent any money in the two years. And so that clearly wasn't a necessary component for me of, of happiness. And so, um, I did some th- other things I went and I, really what I did was went and, and started making movies cause that seemed to be to be really challenging and other people seemed to think it was really fun. Um, and so I tried it and it turns out it was really fun. Um, and I made this one film about the drug war in the slums of Rio and it got nominated, not nominated, shortlisted for an Academy award, won the Tribeca film festival. So that was really fun. Um, but then what was it called? at a certain point, it's called favela rising, uh, back Bell. in 2006 was when I, I made it. Um, but then I like, I had so much fun. I was kind of done with having fun and, uh, I'd met my wife and we'd already started to have kids and I thought, okay, now I want to do something else that's challenging, but again, not fun. And again, not making any more money. So I thought, oh, I guess, I guess giving back. Um, I don't really know what that's like, but again, some people seem to think that's fulfilling. So I did, and I started, um, I didn't just want to write checks. That didn't seem to me very engaging. I wanted to help people that no one else was willing to help. And for me, that started the people that, you know, I was afraid of were ex cons. That's, that's scary. Those, those are, you know, gnarly dudes. And so I figured, okay, if it scares me, that's where I got to go. And, uh, cause also no one else is going there. And so I did, I started helping ex cons and, and realized that, um, as I spent time with them, they they're screwed. Uh, once someone has a criminal record, they can never get a job because everyone does a background check. So I also figured out though, that there's some jobs in the country that, uh, that don't require, uh, are they're, they're in such short supply that even if someone has a record, the employer will just hire them anyway. And these are skill trades where there's a shortage. So construction and commercial truck driving, um, are the two primary areas. 
And commercial truck driving was easier to train because there's schools all over the country. So I just started paying for guys to go to commercial truck driving school, get their CDL licenses, and then they got jobs. And then I, I've done this with now 150 or so uh, people. And, and uh, I think one of them has gone back to, to prison. So it was just an incredibly successful, incredibly you know, good thing. And, and then when we moved out to California, I wanted to keep doing it. And I wanted my buddies to come and join me. And they were like, Matt, you're crazy. You're going to get killed one day. And none of them would join me. And so even the ones who were retired and didn't have anything else to do. And so I was like, oh, man, I really want to join my buddies who are in the tech world. I want to be able to hang out with them. So if they won't come to me, I guess I've got to go to them. And so I thought, but I don't want to do more work. So I don't want to create another company. I don't want to create a firm. Maybe if I coach, oh, that'll be good because then I can talk to them, but I don't have to do any actual work. Like I'll just give them advice and then they'll have to do the work. And so that's what I did. And it turned out to be spot on. And I've been able to, you know, create connection again with all of my friends and create many new ones, including you, Justin. And now I consider you a dear friend. I mean, everyone I coach becomes a dear friend of mine. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was a great move. Amazing. There's so much in there uh, to unpack, but let's start with the, like the thing that's probably most difficult for many people in our audience, which is even getting off the train in the beginning, right? Like you had made money, you became successful. You sold your company for like, I don't even, I don't think you ever told me, but I looked it up one time. It was like hundreds of millions of dollars, right? $500 million or something like that, yeah. which is not nothing. But most people, myself included, after having success, they just want more success. You know, they kind of like have this success and they're like, oh man, that's, that felt really good for a moment. And now I want to go start another company or be an investor and invest in big companies. Like you, you were pretty capable of like knowing yourself and saying, oh, that's not what I want to do. Like, how did you know that? Mm, I'm not sure I'd give myself that much credit. I stumbled around a lot as well. Um, the, the, probably the most defining moment for me of when I actually discovered what I want to do is when I had already started coaching um, and then I was making investments. So, you know, don't give me too much credit. I was making investments as well. And then I realized, you know what? I, I am getting confused by this investment thing. I'm getting confused by the money. Am I doing this for the money? Am I doing this for the connection? Am I doing this because I enjoy the coaching? So let me turn off one of those variables. Let me turn off the money and then let's see what happens. And let me, so I'm not going to make any investments. I'm not going to take any equity. I'm not going to take any cash, nothing. And, um, Therefore, if I enjoy something, I'll keep doing it. But if I don't enjoy it, it would be insane for me to keep doing it. So I'll stop. And as soon as I started doing that, the, I did start to realize which people I wanted to work with and which people I didn't, which situations I wanted to be in and which situations I didn't. And I immediately stopped the ones that didn't feel good. And when I did that, time opened up for me and I filled it with other people in other situations that did actually give me massive energy. So over time, what I did shifted from me liking it to me loving it all the time. And I just kept going and going and going. And then, of course, I just became addicted to it. Like I craved, and today even, that's my probably my biggest problem today is that, you know, on the weekends, I kind of sit and twiddle my thumbs. I'm just waiting for Monday morning to come because I'm so excited. I just love coaching. Um, but particularly again, the way I coach and the people that I coach. And, uh, I think that was the key. That was the key for me to discover by doing it for no money. Um, because if I do something, when I have done something for money early, like it's okay. Once I know exactly what I like, then to add money later on. But in the beginning, it's just, it's too distracting. It's too, it's such a powerful force. Um, and it's so measurable. Um, you know, I coach a bunch of, uh, hedge fund managers and, and they have a similar issue in that their mark to market of their portfolio is so measurable. It's very hard to ignore, but of course they make the best investments when they do ignore the short term outcomes and they just stick to their long term process. And so the key is how do you, how do you, how do I anyway, get that out of my consciousness? And for me, the best way was just to turn it off. Amazing. That's a incredible discipline. And so your coaching method, uh, I don't know if you're, the, I guess, you, you call it the Machari method, right? But it's, it's a you pretty have unoriginal defined, name. Yes. You have an amazing kind of framework for how you think CEOs should operate. And you wrote it down in a book that I recommend all the time uh, called The Great CEO Within. You can find it on Amazon, co-authored by our mutual friend, Alex McCaw, uh, the founder of Clearbit. And um, 
how did you come up with this this method? And can you talk kind of talk a little bit about like what the framework is? Sure. It, it's by the way, I didn't invent it. Um, all I okay. did was read books, you, and and, yeah. and, and, and and then I just summarized those books, and then I put them into like little one pager Google Docs, and then I would just share them with people. I and mean, the first book I read was um, the Andy Gove book on uh, high output management. I was like, oh my gosh! So, so I had you know run this co- or helped run this company. And it had been a complete disaster. I mean, it was a good financial outcome, but operationally it was terrible. And then I didn't like, I wondered how could I have done a better job? So I pick up this book by Andy Gove, read it, and there are all the answers. Like, my gosh, if I'd only done that, the company would have run really well. And then I read the Ben Horowitz book, you know, Hard Thing About Hard Things. And then I read, uh, you know, the, the Bill Owlett book about um, discipline entrepreneurship. And then, you know, I just kept reading more and more. And every single book just had all these incredible insights that seemed like they would work. Um, and then what I did was when I started coaching people, I would test them. I would, you know, write up a little summary and say, go try this. And people, would, the CEOs would do it and they would come back and say, wow, that worked great. Um, and so I realized that the answers are all out there. I just, when I was running the company, I didn't have time to read those books. And I think that most CEOs yeah. don't. So all I did was summarize them into two pages and then share them with the CEOs I was coaching. So they get, everyone has time to read two pages. And so that's really all it was it just became this big collection of summaries and then um one day and and even the method of like there's a a a certain agenda for one-on-one meetings for team meetings there's setting up okrs there's tracking those okrs and and there's giving feedback to each other and unpacking issues none of these things are new or or you know original in any way The, the the big companies all do this so, because what happens is once a company hits product market fit, now they're sort of scaling their people. Either they come up with a management system that takes the vision that's in the CEO's brain and boom, shares it with the entire company in real time, as well as all the problems that the, the, the team is encountering and boom, brings it back up to a decision maker who can actually unblock them. Unless that system gets put in place, each new person will only make it more difficult to operate and eventually the whole thing will crumble. So you can easily tell which companies have created a successful management system by whether or not they're succeeding at scale. So Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, Netflix, they all have this system. And the way you know, they're clearly performing and they have more than 100 people. So they, by definition, they've got this system. And so all I'm doing is taking pieces of their system and cobbling together, like they all have their unique individual points. And I sort of cobble together what I think are the best pieces of each, but it's nothing new. It's all been there before. And frankly, it's all documented out in the world. And then what I did was having documented it all, Alex McCaw, who I am, who I coached at one point said, Matt, you got to share this with the world. You got to turn this into a book. I said, no, I don't. I said, but Alex, if you want to do the work, if you want to go, you know, do the cover design and publish it and, you know, go for it. And so that's what he did. And, uh, and I thank him for it. It's been great. Um, but a lot of this is I only do the things that I enjoy and like the act of publishing didn't seem joyful to me, so I didn't do it. Um, but what I've also found is for every act that I don't find joyful, there is someone else who does. So I just let the people who enjoy it do it as opposed to force myself to do something I wouldn't enjoy. And that's a a pretty revolutionary concept. And it kind of goes to one of the things that we worked on together that you told me about, which is this idea of a zone of genius, right? Which is sticking to the things where that give you energy, uh, that you're good at both the, the Venn diagram of things you think that you're good at and give you energy. And most people, you know, end up in their zone of competence, which is the things they're good at that take away energy from them. And I felt that, uh, you know, I think that's true of like many CEOs and, and I think the revolutionary leap of faith is thinking like, okay, if I only do the things I'm good at that I'm that I enjoy that give me energy, someone else is going to have the zone of genius that picks up the things that I don't want to do. And a That's lot right. of times in companies we just, or in any sort of organizational group, we're like, well, no, I don't believe that it's actually going to happen. So I have to do these things that I don't really want to do. That's right. But you've seemed to, you've been able to like structure a life to just do those zone of genius things, which is pretty incredible. Well, what I, Yeah. And you're right. It is that leap of faith. It is that leap of faith that there's going to be someone else who actually enjoys doing this. Now, if you're just one person, no, you don't have the luxury of only, and you're building a company, you don't have the luxury of doing this. 
Um, but most companies aren't just one person. Um, Alex McCaw might be the exception with Reflect. That's pretty much just one person. Uh, but other than that, there's usually two or at least three. And, uh, and then you can share and find out who loves what. And, and really, it turns out there's not that many different variables about loving things. So most people are either more extroverted or more introverted. They're either they're more thought vision people or process people. They're more relational or they're more solo. I guess that's more like extrovert, introvert. And so they're not that many variables. So if something is, I, I, you know, people management, there are people, there are, I bet I'd say 50% of the world really enjoy people management and 50% don't. So it's not like there's some action that I don't like and nobody else in the world likes. Nah, pretty much every action about 50% of the world that I don't like about 50% of the world does like. So it's actually not yeah. that hard to find other people who, who will enjoy the task. Amazing. Um, so what do you think it is about the kind of common, the, the assembly of, of methods that you've cobbled together and put into your own method that works so well for people? Because you know, when we met, like you came with a glowing recommendation from Steve Huffman, a mutual friend who's the CEO and founder of Reddit. And he was just like, Matt has added billions of dollars in market cap to the value of Reddit, like working with Matt. But like all of those things existed outside, right? Like before, and even like coaching, you know, like there's lots of coaches, right? Like everybody, it seems like everybody now is a coach actually. Um, so what do you think it is about what's so special about how you coach? that is so differentiated that people like have such a, like they review it. Like, and I've been the same. I've said like, Matt is like an incredible coach that you have to work with Matt. If you, you I mean, you're full just for the, the viewer, unfortunately you have like no time anymore to, to coach other people. But like, how do you, you know, what, what is it so that's special and unique about your coaching? So I don't think you're going to like the answer. Um, I'm not sure there is anything special. I mean, there was one person who once said to me, Matt, I don't know if you're the best coach on the planet or you just coach the best people. And I say, <laughs> guilty as charged. I, I agree. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any special sauce around what I do. It's very basic. And you may argue, I can see you're about to. I don't agree. But... I don't agree. I, <laughs> I will say what I think it is. Okay. Well, I, I, I think in terms of the methods, you're right. It's like they're all been published before. And you could read them. You can read, you know, there's books, The 15 Commitments of Con Conscious Leadership, Nonviolent Communication, High Output Management. And you can just assemble like the things that you say to do, right? Like it's not you, there are, like you said, there aren't any original ideas or I'm not sure how, I'm sorry, I don't want to take away credit, but I, most of the ideas are like out there. No, you're spot but on. I, think, I completely agree. What I think you do is I think you are so authentically say, you authentically say what you think and pull no punches and leave no feedback unsaid and insist both direct, bi-directionally that you both give the most honest feedback and receive the most honest feedback. And that I think is very rare among human beings and coaches. Fair enough. That part about feedback, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with. I haven't seen other people do that. I haven't seen, so at the end of every meeting, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or team meeting or whatever, I always say, how can I be better? What would you like about this interaction? But much more importantly, how can I be better? And I always pull out from people, or try to anyway, the worst thought that they have about me, which not only helps me get better, but it also creates a, a really deep connection because now people feel like, oh, I had this awkward thing that I didn't love about Matt, but he, he got me to say it and then he took it so well and then he acted on it. Now they feel like, well, wow, I can tell Matt anything, anytime. And you know that is sort of the underpinning of liking someone that you feel comfortable telling them anything and they'll actually alter their behavior. Um, and so that, yes, that has been a, a secret weapon, but I mean, how, how unoriginal is that asking for feedback? But it's, like, it's, it's also giving feedback. And I think without any fear of the consequence, like one thing I've noticed is you will like when we met, you were like, your business model is bad. <laughs> like with no fear <laughs> of, Oh, he's not going to hire me. He's not going to like me. It's like, he's not going to, you know, you just said like, what you think? And if you think something, you're like, like if I, you, I say something that an answer to a question and you don't believe it, you'll say, I don't believe you, Justin, like that doesn't, I, that doesn't ring true to me. I, maybe I'm wrong, but like that, I don't believe that. 
answer when you I think it seems to me that you believe something else or like whatever you know like you will say say that whatever you honestly think you will say with no filter almost I mean I don't think it's like the lack of filter like you're you know it's like a you know like a some, something wrong I think it's like a learned behavior but I think that is um, really incredible has this incredible is superpower and, and authenticity that uh you know, like most people just don't, don't have. And like, that's why it's like such a useful mirror for, for people who are really dedicated to their self growth. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And I think what that is, is fear. So I think that what I've learned is, is that my fear gives me very bad advice. So certainly I do have thoughts of, Oh, if I say this, then Justin will get pissed off and he won't want to, you know, work with me anymore. Um, but I, I've also learned that that prediction, that thought is just a really bad prediction. And, uh, and so I've played this game with myself where I've forced myself to do whenever I feel fear and I have a thought like, don't do that. I now play this game with myself that I just do the thing that my brain is telling me not to do. And then I see what happens. And inevitably what happens is there's gold there and it just turns out great because my fear comes from my amygdala, which is my, my reptile brain, which is trying to, you know, comes from hundreds of thousands of years ago, which is just trying to keep me alive in the face of a saber toothed tiger, but there are no saber toothed tigers anymore. So aren't, there aren't really life and death situations. So now it's just trying to keep my ego, you know, um, unbruised. Uh, but the reality is, is that it's holding me back from so many things. The opportunity cost is so huge. So I've just found that, that, that fear is just a really bad advice giver. And, and it's so bad. In fact, that I can reliably do the opposite of what it tells me to do. And that's usually a, a, a good path of action. So yeah, that, I think that's, that's key. And that's actually become the basis of my coaching. Cause I find that most people, when they get stuck, it's, they always have an idea of what they need to do, but if it, all I do is listen for wh what's the emotional undertone, are they excited? Are they feeling joy around this proposed solution that they have to the issue? And if that's the case, I'm like, yeah, awesome. That sounds great. Or is it like, oh, I don't know. I'm afraid to do this because if I do this and that will happen. Whenever I hear that, I, I don't, it doesn't take a genius. I just go, oh, you think that will happen? Well, actually, I think the exact opposite is going to happen. And then we just make a bet and we'll see what happens. And if I lose the bet, I'll never give you advice again. And if I win the bet, then you've always got to do what I recommend going forward. And I've made that <laughs> bet hundreds of times and I've, I've never lost because it's actually really easy. And it's not me. It's not just, I promise you, Justin, it's not that I have a superpower. Anybody can do this who isn't in the situation. So you can ask your mother, your sister, your, your, your friend, your, it doesn't matter, anybody. And you describe a situation to them, they won't feel fear because it doesn't affect them. But you'll be, you, they can tell whether you're feeling fear. And that's all you really need to know. You just need someone to let you know, hey, I think you're feeling fear. That's it. Then, you know, just do the opposite of what your brain tells you. And so I, I do want to democratize what I do. I do. I have plenty of people that tell me, Matt, you're unique. No one else can do that. I just think it's untrue. And so I actually am going to hire a coach now, maybe two, maybe three, and I'm going to train them. And on purpose, I'm going to hire someone not famous, not experienced, not anything, not known, like a young, relatively inexperienced person, two or three of them. And I'm going to train them to do what I do. And I think they're going to be even more effective than I am. So I'm going to disprove that a, that I'm unique and B that they need to be some experienced person. It's, it's very inspirational, you know, your willingness to kind of tackle your own fears, but also, f you know, bring up and force people to confront their, own, the other, the things they're afraid of. And I think I learned out of all the things that we worked on together, you know, there's lots of tactical stuff, but that is probably the most valuable thing in my life that I've learned from you. And it actually came up even recently, you know, like we're always as human beings running from things that we're afraid of, especially interpersonal things. So if there's a difficult interpersonal conversation that's looming, you'll like do anything possible to avoid it. Or if you don't have to have it, you'll just like, you know, you, you won't have it. Right. And it came up, I was at renegade burning man last week and I had this situation where I had been and this is funny because I feel a little fear about you know saying this, but like because it's not a high integrity thing, but like 
what had happened was when I first started Atrium, this friend of mine who was in my Burning Man camp, I was um, I gave him some advice on how to raise his round, and he actually ended up getting a term sheet, and he was going to raise it. And I was like, "Oh, you should use my, you know, firm or my company." And he didn't want to. And I was supposed to invest. I had told him that I would invest in his company because I thought it was a good idea, and I didn't. I ghosted him because I was pissed off that he wouldn't use, you know, I thought it was like quid pro quo and I'd helped him and I didn't feel like it was reciprocated. So I just ghosted and like we never talked. And since then we hadn't talked actually. And we got to this situation, like, and, and then I saw him at this thing, you know, we had this big Burning Man camp, like, you know, we kind of just avoid each other for a while. And I wasn't really involved that much in the last couple of years when I was working on startups. So then, then, but then this year I saw him again and, you know, I just went, I kind of had, I went over and did the olive branch and I was like, it kind of went back to old to normal, like how, you know, two guys can like not be close. And then you just start talking again and you're like, Hey, what's up? What's like, and then, it, you know, we started having the conversation, right? Like, like normal, like, and it was kind of went back. But and that, at that point I could have just forgotten it and just proceeded as normal, right? Like as just like forgot it ever happened. But I actually was like, actually the right thing to do is to just say, Hey, I apologize. You know, like I did you wrong. I want to apologize. I did you wrong. I was like caught up with my own ego. I want my company to succeed. I was like, that was, you know, I, I made a mistake and I'm sorry. And so I did that when the old, the, my old impetus would have been like, okay, just like, let it go back to normal and never bring this up again. You know? And he said like, thank you. I've been carrying that for a couple of years, you know, and I forgive you. And that's something like that. I learned, you know, from you, Matt. So I that's awesome. So. I'm getting, I'm getting emotional just hearing it. That's yeah. awesome. And, and so and, and I, what know, I, like, yeah, go ahead. What I really appreciate is that you're sharing this story now on, you know, a very widely viewed channel that's going to be seen by lots of people. And as you said, you felt fear, like even sharing this now, like, cause it's not a high integrity thing. It shows a moment when you did something that you're not proud of. And my guess is that fear is predicting that people will judge you negatively for having that done that thing that you're not proud of. And you don't want people to know that you do those kinds of things. And my prediction no. is the exact opposite is going to happen. You're going to get lots of comments on this, on what you just shared. And the comments are going to be like, wow, Justin, I like you even more now because you're willing to share that. You're willing to share that you're human because every single one of us has done that. In fact, every single one of us continues to do that. But the only people we know that do that are as ourselves. I don't know that you do that. That's the first time I've heard that you do that. You're human like me. So now I like you more because you're relatable. You're connected. Other, otherwise you're just this guy that sold a company for a billion dollars. Like, holy shit. That guy's like superhuman. He's like, God, like he's not related to me in any way. Now you're related to me. Now you're human. Just like I am. Now I really like you. So yeah. good for you for doing that. Thank you. I mean, it feels good. I, I think that like everything, you know, for me in my life, everything I'm trying to carry or that I'm carrying like that, either to be forgiven or what to ask for forgiveness, I want to just get it off my chest. You know, it's so much easier. These things that we're afraid, the conversations we're afraid to have or the feedback we're afraid to give or things we're afraid to say, like it's so much easier in your life. If you just let it go, you know, and say it instead That's of right. carrying it. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Great. I love it. Nice Amazing. Done. <laughs> so tell me like what, I, I, there's a little bit of a sidetrack. Like what, what are the things that, um, you have found have changed the most among the people that you coach when, when you coach them? Like, what are the things that, you know, what are the, what are the big differences between somebody who you see is like they're headed in the right, they're like kind of the, the wrong trajectory. Maybe they're not going to scale. They're not going to make that transition to becoming a great CEO to like the people who, who do make that transition. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's got two parts. My answer first part is, is that when I coach someone in, in hindsight, the only meetings that matter are the first three, like basically all the value is created in those first three. Cause all I'm doing in those three is a creating a process that they follow to inform and to plan and to write out the issues that they're facing. And then, so it's very, they learn the process within three meetings and then they can use that process. If it's effective for them, they can use it with their reports and their entire company, which most end up doing. Um, but in also in that three, by that third meeting, they have, we've already gotten to several of these, I feel fear. And then I basically forced them to go take the action they feel fear about. And then the results come back and the results are 
oh my gosh, that was fantastic. And now they've broken the cycle in their mind of following their fear. So they go from fear-based to non-fear-based in three meetings. And then after that, frankly, they don't ever need to meet with me again. Now, we often end up continuing to meet, mostly just because we like each other and selfishly, I want to you know, continue to connect. But in terms of like the value of the coaching, eh, not really that much after that. That's sort of one thing. That's sort of a big shift that everyone, pretty much everyone goes through. The second, I'm trying to think if there's anyone who didn't have that shift, and I can't think of one. Uh, the second thing, though, is, is a little bit harder, and that is the realization that the CEO role, there are all these functions, we talked about this, alluded to this earlier in the, in the conversation, but there, there are all these functions that a CEO must make sure get done. You got to run the one-on-ones and the team meeting for the exec team. You got to set the vision for the company. You got to meet with investors and fundraise. You got to, you know, there's a whole sort of very basic list. And the key is you, the CEO, don't have to do all those things, but you have to make sure that all of those things get done. And one of the biggest ones is running the one-on-ones and the team meeting of the executive team, basically being the, the people manager. And I can't tell you how many founders there are um, that I work with who they're product visionaries. I mean, what they're really great at is understanding the customer problem, developing a solution for that problem, and then building it. And that's, so they built the original product. They got product market fit. Now they're in this position where they're now CEO of a thousand person company and they just freaking hate the people management but they think that it's their job to be the CEO. So they don't, they don't want to, they don't want to let that go. And the ones who really do great are the ones who eventually recognize that if they don't love to do it, they're actually not even good at it. And so the ones who are willing to let that go and say, you know what, I'm just going to hire someone or bring someone on or, you know, someone who's already on the team, appoint them to do that people management role of the company. So they operate it and I then get to jump back into what I love, which is building product. Those are the ones that really crush it. Um, and I think of, you know, Brian Armstrong at Coinbase and Emily Choi, who does the people management. I mean, you, you couldn't get a bigger success than, than that, you know, in the time frame. And that's what Brian eventually did. He eventually recognized it's not what I love. Now, even he though, it took a while because for, a uh, kind of a long time, he kind of did want to hold on to that, his view of what the CEO role was, but eventually he let it go. And then the company began to soar and he also think, began to have a lot more fun. Yeah. There's, there, I think there's so much in there and in, in being a CEO or really anyone, but I think it's exacerbated in kind of these positions like being a CEO where, um, you have this, there's this kind of ego expectation of what you think it is. And then there was mm -hmm. what you really want it to be. And yeah. They, there's uh, getting from A to B involves a lot of letting go of your ego and expectations. And it kind of coincides with a lot of my friends and you know, your, who are, you know, a high overlap with your coaches. It's like, it coincides with a personal growth path, right? Or personal growth journey where they are like gaining in self-awareness. Like in the beginning, you're holding everything super tightly and you're like, I have to do everything and I have to be in charge and I have to make all these decisions. And then you're like, oh, and there's all these downstream negative consequences of that. Like you don't delegate enough, you get burned out. You're like you're doing things that are in your zone of competence, not in your zone of genius. And for the people who really get to that next level, they let go. They like are willing, they, they grow themselves to a higher level of, self-awareness and, and consciousness and they can let go of those things. Right. So like, what are the ways that like kind of the personal ways that someone grows to get to there, you know, cause you've talked about a little bit of the tactics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the personal ways are just to experiment, experiment one time with letting go of one thing that I think I can't let go of. And then I do. And then all of a sudden it works really well. And so if, if that one thing worked well, well, how about all the other things I think I can't let go of? So we talked about the, the tactics actually are what matter because I don't think big, I think small. And because I think that we can try to plan out all kinds of theories, but in the end, it's just one little example. Let's test it. Let's see. Don't, don't, you don't have to believe my theory, but let's experiment. Let's try having you do that one thing that you think is going to turn out terribly. Let's test that. Do that one thing. 
And oftentimes, you know, it, the really big and scary thing people aren't willing to experiment with. So we have to pick something smaller. And, you know, instead of saying to my board member, you know, I want you gone because you're, you're a terrible board member. That's usually big and scary because if that board member could then like try to destroy my company. Okay. So let's try this other thing. Let's talk to, you know, a, you know, give feedback to this person who's a, you know, junior employee and they're not performing. And if they leave, it's not the end of the world. So, okay, let's give feedback to that person. You think they're going to react badly, but let's give it anyway. And then you give the feedback and then the, the employee is like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I had no idea that you wanted me to be doing something different. I really appreciate that. And suddenly they start to perform. Oh, okay. Well now maybe I can go to my board member and actually share this feedback. It's going to be a tough conversation. Absolutely. But in the end, it'll be the company that I want to be part of. And it's going to be the, the board that I want to be part of. It's going to give me energy then again, to be part of this company. Otherwise what happens is I get de-energized and I eventually don't even want to be part of this company anymore. And that obviously destroys value, but it starts with something small. It starts with something easy. So it's not, I wish I had a big sort of bigger thing to say to you, but I don't. <laughs> no, that's great. Right that's on. great. It's like getting, you know, like being gen gentle with yourself and just experimenting, like setting up a designing experiments so that you can learn and like get comfortable with, uh, yes. with letting go of more and more. Exactly. Exactly. So what's your personal growth edge now? Like, you know, you've, you've done so much work on yourself. Like what are the things that you're working on? I, I ask selfishly cause it's like, I'm always looking for things to improve on my own. And, uh, you know, mm, yeah, I feel like I learned a lot of them from you. Um, uh, two things come to mind. One is everyone's been asking me, everyone, a coach has been asking me to put this whole methodology into software so they can just impress a button and, you know, put it through their whole company. And, you know, the first person asked me was Brian at Coinbase. And I thought, Brian, you're a developer. I'm not. You've got, a, you know, 500 engineers working for you. I have zero. Why don't you build it? Um, but he didn't. And, uh, and so, you know, everyone kept asking me this. So finally, about a year ago, I said, okay, I'll give this, give this a shot. And so I did. I hired a, a small development team and they've been building it. And it's going really well. So that's a lot of fun for me. I'm not sure that's a, that's a well, it is a learning edge. Because now what I get to do is, I get to take all my ideas and I get to test them in, you know, myself as opposed to having other people test them for me. And what I've been able to do is sort of test things much more quickly and much more radically. And so I've made a lot of discoveries there, which has been a lot of fun. And probably the biggest discovery that I made there was, um, I started because it's just natural for me. I started taking the people that were working for me and talking about what no one usually talks about, which is their home life. So I'd say, tell me how, how life is like for you at work, you know, zero to 10, eight being, you know, meeting expectations above eight, meaning, meaning it's better or below eight, meaning no, it's not, not good enough. Same with personal life, same with, um, how the company's performing, same with what it's like to work with your teammates, same with what it's like to work with me. And then I would take each number. And if it were less than eight, I would say, okay, what would make it an eight? What would get it there? And if it were above eight, I would say, what would get to get it to a 10? And oftentimes what I found was the work and the company performance and the teammates and me, that was all sort of like normal stuff that many companies talk about, many managers talk about. And I would work hard to whatever suggestions they had. If they resonated with me, I'd try to make their work life better, the company performance better. But the one that was unique was your home life, like your personal life. No manager ever asks about a person's personal life. And so they would tell me, and sometimes it would be a five because they were, you know, having a difficulty with their, their spouse or they didn't have a spouse and they were lonely or all kinds of different things. And I would help them. And I said, what would get it to an eight? And they would declare, they usually know the answer. I'd say, okay, I'm going to hold you accountable to doing that thing. You know, they say, I never leave the house or I never exercise or I never see friends. Like, okay, well, what can you do? Well, I can go set up a, you know, a, 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 a meetup once a week to get together with three friends. Great. Are you going to, Let's have you schedule that right now. So they put it on the calendar. And what I found was once their personal life became an eight or a nine and eventually a 10, suddenly it unlocked tremendous productivity in their work life. Not only that, but it makes my team incredibly loyal. Like there's no other place now that they can work because there's no other place that's going to care about them in that way. So... And it's really easy. It's not like it, this is a difficult thing. It takes about 10 minutes 
you know, I meet with once every two weeks. That's about it. So that, that's been Amazing. a big fun discovery for me. Incredible. Um, I also want to get back to uh, F- Free World. That's their, your charity, right? Uh, yeah. It's called Free World that you talked a little bit about in your, in your story. Like, tell me more about how people, I think people like don't understand the problem around recidivism very much. And I'd love to like hear about, you know, what you've done, like how people can get involved in, in a causes like that, or should they be donating to yours or, or doing something different? Like tell, tell us, tell us a little bit about free world. Yeah, they definitely shouldn't be donating to mine because mine's well-funded and, and frankly, it doesn't take that much money. Um, and I, yeah. that's what I found about most, you know, things that work. They don't take that much money. Um, and so with, with this, the, the whole criminal justice system in the United States, I guess it's a, uh, to me, the big discovery was realizing, well, I'll just go through the, the, my history. So I grew up in an upper middle class uh, neighborhood and my impression was no one I knew had gone to jail. No one I knew had gone to prison. And, and so in my world, um, if someone went to prison or jail, they were a sociopath. I mean, they were a criminal. They were someone who broke the law. And, and so there was something wrong with their brain. And, and obviously everybody can get a job at McDonald's. So if they chose criminality over McDonald's, it's just, they were lazy. And so they, you know, they deserved whatever they got. And frankly, also they were scary. And so I wanted them away from me. And so lock them up somewhere else, keep them away from me. That's, that's great. And then, uh, then and, and by the way, that mentality that I had, I don't think that's unique. I think that many, many, many Americans have that mentality. And yeah. then it was just coincidentally, I ended up making this film in Brazil about the, the drug war and um and it took me into the worst slums in brazil and i realized when i got there oh my god there are no schools here and so people still need to eat and so in order to get money to buy food they've got to do something and the best available job was joining the drug gang so it wasn't like the the worst people joined it it was the best people who joined it and then i thought to myself oh thank god i live in a country where there's schools everywhere so people don't have to make that choice in my country so then I come back and I go, I'm in New York and I make a second movie. And this is about the, uh, the best amateur heavyweight boxers in the world, which coincidentally congregate in the South Bronx, basically to train against each other. And, uh, and then I spend time in the South Bronx, which is one of the worst slums in, in New York and in, in, in the country and realize, oh my God, there are schools here, but they're so bad. They might as well not exist. So it's the same issue in order, but these people still have to eat. And then if they get a, criminal record if they do anything and by the way the policing in poor neighborhoods is you know you and i have done many things that had we lived in a poor neighborhood we absolutely would have gotten picked up and convicted like if you've ever punched somebody justin i know i have and yeah. you know i've never got yeah i've never gotten punished for it but had i punched someone living in a poor neighborhood i would have gotten arrested and thrown and convicted and so once and so i realized that again and the same thing as in brazil people are joining the drug gang in order to eat. It's a very rational response. And so I thought to myself, is it possible that these people are just acting rationally based on their environment and just surviving? So could I, and the way to prove that is if I could take one person and get them to get and keep a legitimate job. I mean, one ex incarcerated person to get and keep a a legitimate job, then it would prove that they're not sociopaths. And so I did, I just took one guy getting out of Rikers and he looked like a thug, talked like a thug, acted like a thug. And, you know, six foot four black guy with prison tattoos all over him. I mean, scary looking dude. And I wouldn't hire him. And I thought to myself, why wouldn't I hire you? I wouldn't hire you because the way you dress, the way you talk, and the way you act. Okay, so let's change that. Let's have, me, let's have you dress like, you know, preppy guy like me in a collared shirt and a pair of khaki pants. And so he did, went down to Goodwill and bought that for him. Cost like, I don't know, 60 bucks. And then let me have you, you know, talk like me, you know, there were sort of some grammatical things that, that, you know, urban are like, Hey, I, uh, you know, let me ask you a question. I done did that. So they're just like three or four phrases. They're very few. And every time he said one and I have him, I'd write it down what he said. Then I'd write down what the grammatically correct way to say it is. And I just show it to him. He just say it three times. He's a native English speaker. So he very quickly learned the grammatically correct way. And, and by the way, I always asked him, do you want to do this? And he always said, yes. And then the third thing was, I said, 
let me show you how to say excuse me, please, and thank you. And he did, and it opened doors for people, and look people in the eye and say hello and shake their hand, and when he left a room, say goodbye and look people in the eye. And that was it, those th very basic things. And so after about a week, it was bone chilling. I mean, it was like, here was this guy who might as well have been my roommate at Yale. And I, uh, I, he went and the first job he applied for, he got it instantly. Then of course, he got let go two weeks later when they did the background check. And this kept happening over and over and over again. So that's when we figured out, okay, let's find something, a job where they don't care about your background. And that's when we discovered commercial truck driving. But the, that was the big realization for me is that I myself thought that people who were put in prison were sociopaths. And now I realize it's not true at all. People who are put in prison just grew up in the wrong zip code. And once they're there, it's almost impossible to get out. So we're just creating a pathway for them to get a legitimate job. And, and they all want it and they all do the work. And once they get it, they all stay there. Turns out that making 60 grand a year legitimately erases all the problems. They can pay for rent. They can pay for food. They're done. That's it. Amazing. So what are the things that people can do if they, you know, want to help work on this problem? I, I don't think, I mean, just know that, that someone, that's it. Just realize that it's not, they're, these are not evil people. And in fact, I mean, I remember the a po point where w with that first guy, we went, we're going to an employer and we're going to, and, and he was the one who said, I should tell them that I've got a criminal background. And I was like, no, no, you gotta, you gotta hide that. You gotta keep, he's like, Matt, that wouldn't be honest. I need to be honest. I need to be truthful. And I thought, oh my God, here I am being taught integrity by a convicted criminal. And that's when I realized again that we don't, the people who have not been put in prison, we don't have some, we don't have any moral authority. In fact, we're likely behaving worse than the people who have gotten put in prison. We just haven't been put under a microscope and, and been locked up for it. Um, so again, I don't think there's anything that people who want to help need to do other than realize that people who have been convicted are normal, rational people who are just in a circumstance where they did what they, and I'm not saying everybody, of course there are sociopaths out there, but the vast majority of people who have been put in prison are not. That's it. No. That a realization alone that punishment doesn't work. What works is basically jobs. That's it. Amazing. Well, I, I salute you for your good work. I mean, you've done a lot to change a lot of people's lives, both, I guess at the top of the pyramid CEOs and then people who are, you know, just finding their feet after post incarceration. So well, I do it for fun. None of this is to make the world a better place. I just enjoy it. That's all. What is it about, you know, what is it about connecting with people that you enjoy so much? Good question. I have no idea, but I just love it. And the deeper the connection and the deeper the bond, the more I get off on it. Um, I don't, I can't explain it. I think I'm just, I'm just tribal. It just makes me, gives me, there's two things I love in life, connection and laughter. And I think they're related. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, if you can tell me why that's, that's the, I'd be indebted to you. I, my guess is it relates to the fact that as a human, I'm a tribal being. Like we grew up in tribes of a hundred to 150 people. And now we live in a world where we often live in a, our, our money buys us aloneness. We live in our own houses and, and the more money we have, the bigger house we have, the higher gate we have, the more alone we are. And so I feel this craving to live back in community. So, um, and I also feel this craving to live back in nature. So what I do now is, um, we have a house and, and I, at, in the evening, we have dinner together, me and my family, and then we, my wife and I put the kids to sleep, and then I, uh, I cuddle with my wife, and we have our intimate time. And then I get out of bed, and I grab my bivy sack, and I walk outside, and I kid you not, and I walk to the lot next door where my buddy lives and his, and his friends, and, uh, and we sleep out. We sleep out, or at least I do. I sleep out on the lawn, and uh, I sleep outside every day, 
and it's amazing. And I just feel like I'm in nature because I am. And so that plus the community, it's all I need. It's amazing. That's a, that's such a gift to realize, you know, when you, that's a, yeah, so to realize that about yourself and to be able to give yourself what you need. I love that. All right. I mean, I think that's, that's what I had. Do you have any final closing thoughts, advice for, for CEOs out there or founders or people who want to be founders? Keep watching Justin's show. He's got the <laughs> answers. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, I, guys, I, I guess I'll do the closing now too. We'll do it live, all live. So thanks for, that was the podcast. Uh, I'll link, uh, Matt Mochari's website down below and his book, The Great CEO Within, which is an incredible book. Uh, it's the guidebook that you should have if you're starting a company or um, really running any kind of organization. And um, like and subscribe to this podcast on YouTube. Rate us five stars on iTunes. And I'll see you guys next week. Peace.